Evolutionists claim to be able to date their finds up to billions of years through multiple methods. What they don't tell you is that each of these methods requires unverifiable assumptions. Dendrochronology assumes that every tree only produces one ring per year. However, Pinus radiata, a plantation pine, has been found to produce up to five rings per year, which are often indistinguishable, even under the microscope, from annual rings. Besides, isn't it a little coincidental that the oldest living tree on Earth is the bristlecone pine? at about 5,000 years? That's not very far from the time of the flood. Dating ice cores assumes a constant rate of seasonal change in ice accumulation over years to produce one layer per year. But in 1989, two B-17 flying fortresses and six P-38 lightning fighters were removed from over 200 feet of ice, showing hundreds of layers. The trouble is, the planes were less than 50 years old. Thermoluminescence, used to date pottery and other heated artifacts, assumes a uniform radiation dose rate and that the total measured radiation dose resulted from the object or artifact being in a strictly constrained environment identical to that in which it was found. Fission track dating and the many versions of radiometric dating all make assumptions on what isotopes were present from the beginning and, even more unverifiable, a constant rate of decay. How can evolutionist scientists just assume what cannot be observed and then expect us to take their word for it on their dating techniques? I had to investigate. Published posthumously in 1651, Leonardo da Vinci's treatise on painting was the earliest known observation that trees grew rings annually with their thickness determined by their growing conditions. The concept is fairly basic. A tree is constantly growing its trunk outward to be able to sustain its branches and foliage. It does so by adding cells to its outside and expanding via a layer of cells near the bark known as a vascular cambium. During the growing season, when the tree receives more water, it grows faster, leaving behind the lighter portion of each ring. As the dry season proceeds, the tree's rate of growth slows down, leaving the darker and denser portion of the ring. One growing season and one dry season creates a full ring, and represents one full year. Knowing this, after drilling a core through a tree, we can count the number of rings to determine the number of seasons the tree has been through. Additionally, by the size of the light portion of the ring, we can determine whether each growing season was long, dry, or wet. As a tree can live through forest fires, volcanic eruptions, and other dramatic events over a course of centuries, we can see the effects of them in the rings. Even with a dubious claim such as an unverified tree producing five tree rings in a single year, we can also calibrate between between different trees to compensate for the outlying years when the area happens to have no dry season, no growing season, or even multiple growing and dry seasons. We can also use rings in a living tree that mark dramatic events to calibrate the rings in trees that have already died. By lining up these distinct rings, we can learn even more about the environment of an area in the past for as far back as the area has trees that show overlapping ring development. This technique is called cross-dating. This is where the bristlecone pine becomes relevant. Being a desert plant, the bristlecone pine could not survive a worldwide deluge or being submerged for the better part of a year. So the fact that it has been dated at 5,067 years shouldn't be a gigantic surprise. Cross-dating it with other bristlecone pines that have died in the past few centuries, however, we can see a continuous record going back almost 14,000 years. In this record, we see no sign of any extended period of submergence at any point, and therefore no record of a worldwide flood. Using other dating methods to determine the age of ancient petrified trees, we can also use cross-dating to determine relative ages and climatic changes in forests millions of years old. This gives us an insight into climatic conditions over ranges of time, giving us a much more vivid picture of ancient ecosystems. Ice core dating can give us even more environmental information from the past. In polar regions, as snow accumulates, it also is affected by seasonal changes. During the summer, the sun is visible day and night, causing a small degree of melt. During winter, the sun is down day and night, allowing the layer to freeze. This process causes alternating layers of light and dense ice. The weight of each layer presses on lower layers, making them denser until they turn to fern, which is one of the intermediate stages between snow and glacial ice. As the fern turns to ice, gas and air within is sealed into bubbles, capturing samples of the atmosphere at the time the ice was formed. As the pressure increases with subsequent accumulation, the crystal structure of the ice changes from hexagonal to cubic, allowing air molecules to move into the cubic crystals, becoming transparent as it forms a lattice structure called a clathrate. 
During this process, the ice becomes thinner and thinner, flowing outward where it eventually ends up in the ocean, often as part of an iceberg. These ice flows heavily distort the layers as they approach the ocean, especially in areas outside of the Arctic and Antarctic circles where there are numerous melts and freezes per year, resulting in numerous layers, known as melt layers. This is why ice cores are only taken in the stable ice in the interior of polar masses where ice flow is minimized or non-existent. This was made apparent in 1989 when eight World War II airplanes were recovered from the southern tip of Greenland. In July of 1942, a squadron of pursuit planes and bombers en route to Reykjavik, Iceland, were forced to crash land about 15 kilometers from the coast on the southern tip of the Greenland ice cap after becoming lost and running out of fuel. In 1988, the planes were found under 250 feet of ice and snow and reportedly many hundreds of ice layers. Being on a glacial flow, they were found two kilometers away from the actual crash site, nowhere near where an ice core would ever be taken. Dating ice cores is not just a matter of counting rings. Cross-checking methods include tests for electrical conductivity and measurements for inclusion of gases, particles, radionucleotides, and various molecules. Radiocarbon dating can also be used on the carbon in trapped carbon dioxide, so there are many ways to cross-reference dating for ice cores. We can also synchronize timescales for ice cores from the same hemisphere by identifying layers which include material from specific volcanic events. More significantly, by observing the magnetic alignment of metal particles in ice cores, we can also detect changes and reversals in the Earth's magnetic field over time. The scientific consensus is that there are deep enough ice layers to account for 1.5 million years of deposition, but have only as yet accounted for about 850,000 years. In none of those 850,000 years worth of ice cores do we see any evidence for a worldwide flood. No sedimentary layers and no solid spans of oceanic ice. If the flood account is true, it must have occurred before any of the ice was deposited. This would necessarily mean that in the time since the flood, we should have records for at least four magnetic reversals as they appear uniformly around the world, yet no records of any reversal have been made in any mariner's logs. This also means that there would have been an average of 200 warm and cold seasons per year, every year, since the flood. This has no precedent anywhere in recorded history. The creationist model does not survive any attempts to correlate what we see in ice cores in any other record. Thermoluminescence is one of the most inexpensive methods for dating ceramics or anything else containing crystalline materials which have undergone heating beyond 500 degrees Celsius. In nature, crystalline materials contain imperfections in their crystalline structure. Some of these imperfections are dips in the crystalline material's electric potential where free electrons may be attracted and trapped. When this material is sufficiently heated, the electrons gain enough energy to break free, clearing the entire artifact of these electrons entirely. Once this material cools, it begins capturing electrons again. This is referred to as being zeroed. The rate at which radiation bombards the sample is known as a dose rate, which is calculated by the rate of bombardment in the area at the time. There is a uniform dose rate for each location that is assumed from observation that I will address shortly. But for now, suffice it to say that based on these observed rates, we can measure the amount of absorbed electrons by simply reheating a sample of the artifact and measuring the luminosity resulting from their release. This gives us a date when the artifact was most recently heated to 500 degrees, and therefore, a minimum age for the culture or people in the area. Fission track dating is based on a similar concept. Instead of dating ceramics or more recent artifacts, fission track dating measures the damage done to a crystalline structure by the radioactive decay of uranium-238. This decay is responsible for approximately 40% of Earth's internal temperature and leaves tracks from the emission of uranium-235. It is simply an academic process to count the number of fission tracks present to determine the age of the crystal. The rate of uranium decay is is in fact assumed, but we do know for certain that there is a maximum amount of decay that is possible for uranium-238 in crystals. As radioactive elements decay, they also release heat. For uranium-238, the assumed rate of decay is equal to the currently observed half-life of 4.5 billion years. If the amount of fission tracks we see in contemporary crystals had occurred in only 6,000 years, the amount of heat generated by nuclear fission would erase the fission tracks in a process called annealing, essentially zeroing the reading in the same way that heating ceramics will zero thermoluminescent dating. Essentially, if the creationist prediction were true, there would be no fission tracks to count. A faster rate of decay means a faster release of heat via electron volt discharge. To illustrate this, samarium has a half-life of 1.06 times 10 to the 11th years. 
Dividing that by 6,000 years, we get 166 million, which is what you would also have to multiply the current release by to determine the amount of heat released if the young Earth creation model were true. The heat differential would be deadly and obvious. This is one of the reasons that decay rates are not merely assumptions, but there are many ways to cross-check. As I've already discussed in multiple episodes, when a radioactive element decays, it ejects protons and neutrons in the form of an alpha, beta, or gamma particle, along with a burst of energy. What remains is a lower isotope such as carbon-14 to nitrogen-14, potassium-40 to argon-40, or just about any isotope of uranium to lead. In carbon dating, wherever we find ratios of carbon and nitrogen, we also look for corresponding or conflicting date ranges in non-radiometric methods such as tree rings or luminescence. Despite variables in C14 decay and depletion, readings can be cross-checked and accounted for indicating a specific window of time and degree of accuracy. It is often asserted that objects older than 50,000 years would not have any C14 at all, but that is not the reason why carbon dating isn't used on items older than 50,000 years. The reason items of that age are rarely dated with radiocarbon is because at about that amount of decay, it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish between intrinsic C14 and C14 from potassium-40 decay and cosmic rays. This is one of the reasons why diamonds are occasionally found with C14 contamination. Diamonds are usually found near volcanoes. Being formed deep within the Earth, they are constantly pelted by gamma rays which also turn stable carbon into C14. Diamonds may be incredibly strong, but no matter how strong an object's carbon-carbon bonds are, they cannot withstand the two nuclear forces. Most radiometric dating methods have built-in cross-checks due to the decay of isotopes in their decay chains. For example, there are 26 isotopes in the decay chain of uranium-238, including thorium, radon, and polonium. Each of these isotopes, in turn, have their own half-life. Wherever we find ratios of uranium to lead, we can cross-check it with ratios of the other isotopes in the decay chain. This means that a single measurement of uranium-lead is actually several measurements of multiple ratios. The same concept applies to potassium argon dating. Wherever we find ratios of potassium and argon, we also find a third ratio of calcium-40. Potassium-40 breaks down into precisely 11.2% argon-40 and 88.8% calcium-40. Additionally, from there, argon-40 breaks down to argon-39 at a predictable rate. Both of these ratios allows us to calibrate or correct accordingly. Wherever we find ratios of rubidium-87 and strontium-87, we also find amounts of strontium-86 and other stable isotopes in the rubidium-87 decay chain. These stable isotopes also allow us to calibrate and correct for any strontium-87 that would have been there initially. Wherever we find ratios of samarium and neodymium, we also find ratios of lutetium to hafnium and rhenium to osmium, which allows us to cross-check and verify the dates we read. Even with all these methods of cross-checking, there is still the remote chance that any given radiometric date might be wrong. But it would be an impressive string of remote coincidences if all of the cross-checks were erroneous as well. So far, all the readings I've discussed are in reference to the Earth. There is yet another cross-check we can make with radiometric dating techniques by by dating the geology of the moon. As has been demonstrated numerous times, we still see the same correlation between parent isotopes and their decay chains regardless of which radiometric techniques we use, no matter where we use them. Each dating technique has its own set of strengths and weaknesses as well as a means of cross-checking. When comparing multiple readings from multiple methods, we can correct for nearly any anomaly that presents itself. This is why scientists are so confident in their dating methods and the environmental data they produce. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.